The Five on a Hike Together by Enid Blyton. It was Julian's idea in the first place. He and Dick were given an unexpected long weekend holiday from school, which coincided with George and Anne's October half-term break. With Dick's enthusiastic agreement, he'd written to their sister Anne, suggesting that she and cousin George should get Timmy out of the school kennels and join them for a few days hiking across the moors. So, after receiving permission from their parents and their housemistress, the two girls, carrying rucksacks and torches and clothes and macs and chocolates and everything necessary for a few nights away, not forgetting biscuits for Timmy, went to meet Dick and Julian at the village store in Pippin Village. Timmy went nearly mad with joy at being with all four of his friends again, barking and wagging his long tail and sending a pile of tins crashing to the floor in his delight. The shopwoman was surprised by all the noise and even more surprised when they asked her to prepare 32 sandwiches for them to take away. But she was a good-natured woman, and told them she was used to cutting sandwiches, as both her sons worked at the prison on the moor, and took sandwiches for their lunch break every day. It wasn't long before she'd prepared a great pile of them, and a chunk of homemade cake at no extra charge. The children thanked her, and set off with Timmy running in front. The October sun shone down warmly, and the trees glowed yellow and red and golden, dressed in their autumn colourings. Eventually, the five climbed over a stile and walked across fields to a curious little hill where Timmy suddenly went mad with excitement. What's the matter with Timmy? Well, according to my map, this place is called Rabbit Hill. And Timmy can see and smell them everywhere. Oh, yes! Look! Over there! Hundreds of rabbits! Big ones, little ones, and... Come back, Timmy! Come back! Timmy! Timmy! It's no good calling him, George. He won't catch one anyway. They're too nippy for him. Yes. As soon as he chases one down one hole, another bobs up behind him. Come on. Keep going. He'll join us when he sees we're going on. We've got some way to go yet. All right. Julian, do we sleep at farmhouses at night? Farmhouses for two nights and inns on the others. I've marked them all down on the map. Blue Pond Farm is our first stop. Suppose they haven't room for us. Well, Dick and I can sleep in a barn if necessary and... Where's Timmy? What? Timmy! He's gone! Disappeared! And he had to. They went about calling his name and looking everywhere, but couldn't find him, until quite by chance they came upon him stuck halfway down a rabbit hole. He was scrabbling with his feet, trying to get out, but it was no good. He was well and truly stuck. It took the children 20 minutes to get him out. He whined and went to George, who ran her fingers over him, but could find nothing wrong but still he whined, and George was quite worried about it. But they went on their way, ate their delicious sandwiches at lunchtime, and then set off for Blue Pond Farm. Timmy followed, but after a time started limping, and they all decided that at the next village they would try and find a vet to check on it. So on they went, with Timmy following on three legs, his left hind one being held off the ground. It was a rather gloomy little company that came to Beacon's village, and they made their way to a small inn, where a woman was shaking a duster out of a window. Excuse me, is there a vet anywhere in this district? We want someone to look at our dog's leg. No, no vet here. Nearest one's over six mile away. But if you want your dog's leg seen to, go up to Spiggy House. Mr Gaston lives there with his horses. He knows about dogs too. He's nice, he is, but I expect he'll be out with his horses and he may not be in till it's almost dark. Thank you. Look, I'll go up to Mr Gaston's with George and Timmy, but Dick, I think you and Anne should go on to Blue Pond Farm where I'd planned to stay the night and make arrangements for us. We don't want to leave it to the last minute, do we? No. I'll go on with Anne now. It'll be pretty dark soon. Right you are. 
After we've seen Mr Gaston, we'll come back to this village and make straight for the farmhouse. It's about a mile and a half away. Thanks for coming with me, Julian. Let's go now, shall we? See you later, Dick and Anne. Right. Goodbye. Bye. Julian and George and Timmy set off up the hill to Spiggy House, and Dick and Anne turned and walked through the little village. As Julian's directions were not very clear, they decided to walk on and ask the first person they saw to help them. But they met nobody except a man driving a little cart. Dick hailed him. Excuse me, are we on the right road for Blue Pond Farm? R. Is it straight on or do we take any lanes? R. What does he mean, R? He's pointing to the west with his whip. Oh, yes. We turn right up there, do we? R. Gee up. Well, if we find the farmhouse after all those R's, we'll be clever. Come on, Anne. It began to get dark very suddenly as they went on up the road and came to a turning on the right. This must be the one the man meant. So they walked down it. Tall hedges on both sides made it look like a tunnel. So Dick used his torch, and eventually they came to a stile. Thinking this might lead to the farm, they went over it and found themselves in a large field. They walked across it and came to another stile that led to what looked like the edge of a moor. But no farmhouse was to be seen, and no lights anywhere. And just to make things worse, it started to rain. And then, as they stood there with the rain dripping on them, a sound came so unexpected and startling that they clutched each other in alarm. Dick! What is it? What are those bells? What are they ringing for? I've no idea. I wish they'd stop. They frighten me. They're not church bells. No, they're certainly not church bells. They're a warning of some kind, I'm sure. Fire? No. We'd see a fire if there was one. War? No. They used to use bells and beacons to warn people of wars a long time ago, but not now. Dick, that village was called Beacons. Do you suppose... Oh, Dick, are we hearing long ago bells? They don't sound like bells I've ever heard in my life. Good gracious, no. They're not long ago bells. Those bells are being rung now, at this very minute. But why do they ring on this dark night? I don't like being lost like this with those bells ringing madly. Oh, they've stopped. Oh, Dick, let's find Blue Pond Farm as soon as ever we can. Come on, then. Keep close to the hedge. If we follow it, we must come to somewhere new. We mustn't wander onto the moorland. Dick took Anne's arm and kept to the hedge. At last they arrived at a path that led to a lane, and then, oh, a wonderful sight. Not far off there was a light shining. They came to a low stone wall and followed it to a broken-down gate. They opened it and went along a muddy path which led to the door of a stone cottage. Nearby was the window which showed the light they had seen so thankfully. The two children could see an old woman inside, bent over some sewing. Dick knocked hard on the door. The old woman never moved. He knocked again more loudly. Still the old woman sewed on placidly. Dick tried the door, and it opened. He walked boldly in, followed by Anne, and entered the room where the old lady was. She didn't look up and Dick had to walk right over to her before she knew they were there. She leapt up in such a fright that her chair fell over. I'm sorry. We knocked. But you didn't hear. Oh, you gave me such a fright. Where did you come from this dark night? We've been looking for this place. Blue Pond Farm, isn't it? We wondered if you... No good talking to me, my dear. That was a post I am. You've lost your way, I suppose. Well, you can't stay here. My son won't have no one here at all. You'd better be gone before he gets back. He's got a nasty temper, he have. Oh, dear, Anne. Surely she can see how wet we are. I can guess what you're saying. You're wet and tired. But it's my son, you see. He don't like strangers here. But look, 
The girl can go up those stairs to the loft. There's a mattress up there. You can stop there for the night. But don't come down till I call you in the morning. I'll get into trouble if my son knows you're here. You and my lad will have to sleep out in the shed or somewhere. Now off you both go before my son gets back. I'm frightened, Dick. You've got to shelter, Anne. Go to the loft. Eat your sandwiches, get dry and get to sleep. I'll find somewhere and see you in the morning. But what if George and Julian arrive? I'll keep a lookout for them. Now off you go, quickly. Anne went up to the loft, wet and hungry and tired. She ate all her food, lay down on the mattress, pulled an old rug over herself and fell fast asleep. Dick, below, came to a small barn with piles of straw in one corner. He flashed his torch cautiously around and went inside and shut the door, flung himself down on the straw and immediately fell asleep. Outside, the moon came up in the clear sky, casting its light on the desolate stone house and its ill-kept outbuildings. After a short while, Dick was awakened by a strange tapping sound coming from the window above his head. And then he heard a voice. Dick! Dick! Dick was amazed. Could it be Julian? No, it wasn't Julian's voice. He went cautiously to the window and could just make out a face, dim and wild-eyed, with a round bullet-like head. The voice spoke again. Dick, I know you're there. I saw you go in. Come to the window. I've got that message for you. Come on, I've got to go in half a tick. I'm here. Good. Well, here's the message from Naylor. Two trees, gloomy water, saucy Jane, and he says, Maggie knows. And he sent you this. Maggie's got one too. A piece of paper fluttered in through a broken pane. Dick picked it up in a daze. Then the voice came again. You heard all that, Dick. Two trees, gloomy water, saucy Jane and Maggie knows too. Now I'm going. Then there was silence. Dick sat bewildered. After a short while, he put his torch on cautiously and looked at the piece of paper he had picked up. There were a few pencil marks on it and some words printed here and there. It made no sense at all. So putting it in his pocket, he lay back in the straw. After a while, someone entered the barn, shutting the door behind them. Dick, hardly daring to breathe, caught a glimpse of a man. It wasn't the same man as before, because this man had a head of thick hair. Dick hoped and prayed he wouldn't come over to the straw. He didn't. He sat down on a sack. After a while, Dick heard him muttering something about how much longer he would have to wait, saw him get up, look out of the door, and go back and sit down again. Then Dick felt his eyes closing, and he fell asleep. When morning came, he awoke suddenly and sat up. He was alone in the barn, and he wondered if it had all been a dream. He stood up and stretched himself, feeling dirty, untidy and hungry, and worried about Anne. As he cautiously looked out of the barn door, a man came into sight. It was the man he had seen waiting in the barn the night before. He looked very angry about something, and Dick dodged back into the barn. To his relief, he heard the man's footsteps die, and the sound of a gate somewhere being opened and slammed shut. Dick decided to go out and get Anne out of the house immediately, and knowing it was no good knocking, he walked straight into the kitchen and found the old woman washing dishes at a cracked sink. Forgotten about you and the girl too. Get her down quickly before my son gets back, and then go, both of you. Can you sell us some food, bread, and cheese? No, or... no, I tell you, go, go. Get the girl quickly. Go on. Oh, it's too late. He's here. Hey, you boy. Who 
what do you want here? You clear out. I, I wanted to know if your mother could sell us some food. Us? Us? Who's us? You fetch him here and I'll show you what I do to boys who come round here stealing eggs. Yes, all right. I'll go and fetch him. No, oh, no, you come back. Don't you hang around here or you'll get what's coming to you. Dick, by this time, was outside and running down the path. He stood behind a shed, heart thumping, knowing he had to wait and go back for Anne. After a short while, he saw the man come out of the house with a pail of steaming food, and Dick guessed he was going to feed some chickens. He had to take the chance of fetching Anne. He rushed up to the house and straight into the kitchen, shouting to her, and within seconds her scared face appeared at the bottom of the stairs. Dick caught her by the arm, threw a coin on the table, and they both tore off out of the house and down the path to the hedge they had followed the night before. They ran along the side of it until they were well clear and back on the edge of the moor. Oh, Dick! What a horrible place! And that awful man! Honestly, I think Julian must be mad to choose a place like that. Not only was it a horrible house, it wasn't even a proper farm. I don't think it could possibly have been Blue Pond Farm. Anne, we made a mistake when we got lost last night. In that case, George and Julian would be dreadfully worried, won't they? Wondering what has become of us. Do you suppose they're at the real Blue Pond Farmhouse? We'll have to find out. Golly, I do feel mucky and untidy. I feel awful. And I do. Look, there's a little stream over there. Let's go and wash our hands and faces. They did a little washing in the cold water of the stream and were just combing their hair and saying how hungry they felt when a boy came through a nearby gate. Hello, you two. Are you out hiking? Yes. Can you tell me if that place up there is Blue Pond Farmhouse? <laughs> That's not even a farmhouse. That's Mrs Taggart's place, and a dirty old place it is too. Don't go there, or our son will drive you off. He's a terror. We call him Dirty Dick. No, Blue Palm Farm is down along there to the village, past the Three Shepherds Inn and away up to the left. Thanks. That's all right. Have a nice walk. The boy waved and set off across a moorland path, and Dick and Anne, both feeling very cross with the man who had kept saying R and sent them the wrong way, set off towards the village. They decided to go to the inn and from there telephoned Julian and George at Blue Pond Farm. At last they arrived at Beacon's village and were just making their way to the inn when they heard a familiar voice calling to them. Dick! Dick! Anne! Hey, Dick! Dick! <laughs> Julian! <laughs> George! <laughs> Timmy! <laughs> oh, Jew, I'm so glad to see you. We lost our way last night. George, is Timmy all right? Oh, yes. You see... Have you had breakfast? No. Nor have we. We were so worried about you, we were just going to see the police. But now we can all have breakfast together and tell our news. Are you all right, Anne? You look pale. I'm all right now we're all together again. Just very hungry, that's all. We'll go to the inn and ask for breakfast straight away. All news later. Come on. Good morning. Good morning. I expect it's a bit late for you, but we haven't had any breakfast. What have you got? Well, there's porridge and cream, and I've got some of our own bacon and eggs cooking on the stove right now. Will that do? Oh, and coffee with cream. Oh, I could hug you. <laughs> well, go on into the dining room, and I'll bring it in as soon as it's ready. Your news first. How did you get on at Spiggy House with Mr Gaston? Very well. He was out with the horses when we arrived, but he had a very nice wife who let us wait in the house for him. He didn't get back till half past seven. Then he looked at Timmy's leg and did something to it. I don't know what. Put it back in place, I suppose. Timmy gave a yell, George flung herself on him and Mr Gaston roared with laughter at George. Well, he was rough with Timmy's leg, but he certainly knew what he was doing and Timmy's perfectly all right now, aren't you, Timmy? <laughs> What did you do then? Well, Mrs Gaston insisted on giving us a wonderful supper, so we stayed. 
and didn't leave until about nine o'clock. We didn't worry about you because we thought you'd be at Blue Pond Farmhouse. But when we got there and found you hadn't arrived, well, we were in a state. They were very nice at the farm and put us up for the night. And we thought if you hadn't turned up by this morning, we'd go to the police and report you missing. So down we came without any breakfast. That shows how worried we were. There's a nice smell coming from the kitchen now, though. It's like magic. Just what I'm longing for. Here we are, then. Toast and marmalade to come. And if you want anything else, just ring the bell. There's some porridge for the dog, too. Oh, oh thank, thank you. you. That's marvellous. Too good to be true. Well, help yourself, everybody. Dick, you haven't told us what happened to you two last night. Well, the plain fact is... Pass us all, please, George. Thanks. We got lost. And when we did get somewhere, we thought it was Blue Pond Farm, and we stayed the night there. Didn't the people there tell you you weren't at the right place? Well, the old woman there was stone deaf. I say, isn't this bacon good? And she didn't understand a word we said. Oh, it was a horrible place. And we were worried because you didn't arrive. Actually, we had a pretty poor time, Drew. Anne had to sleep in an awful loft, and I slept in straw in a barn. Not that I minded that, but, well, peculiar things happened in the night. At least, I think they did. I'm not really sure if it wasn't all a dream. What peculiar things? Well, I think perhaps I'll tell you when we're on our way again. You didn't say anything to me about it, Dick. To tell you the truth, I forgot about it because the other things that happened. Having to get away from that man and wondering about Julian and George and feeling so hungry. It must have been an awful night for you trying to find your way in the dark. It poured with rain too, didn't it? Yes, but it was the bells that frightened me most. Did you hear them? They suddenly clanged out. And they made me terribly scared. I couldn't make out what they were. Whatever were they ringing bells for? Didn't you know? They were rung from the prison that that lady in the shop told us about. They were rung to warn people that a prisoner had escaped. I'm glad I didn't know that. I'd have been even more frightened. Have they caught him? I don't know. But we'll ask the innkeeper when she comes in. They asked her, and she shook her head, but told them that all the roads were being watched as he was a pretty dangerous criminal. After breakfast, they paid the innkeeper and set off down the village street, then along a lane which led them into a valley with a gurgling stream running through it. There they sat on a clump of heather while Dick began his tale of what had happened the night before. He told them about the old woman who was afraid her son would be angry if she let them stop the night, and how he'd slept in the straw and woke up to hear someone calling, Dick, Dick. How he had been given the message, Two Trees, Gloomy Water, Saucy Jane and Maggie Nose. George laughed and said he was dreaming. But then a thought struck him. He searched quickly in his pockets and drew out the dirty piece of paper with a few words on it and a few lines. Julian took the paper, and they all knew that Dick had not been dreaming. It had actually happened. Well, I can't make any sense of this paper, but it's obviously a plan of something. Have you any more to tell us, Dick? Yes. Later on, the son of the deaf woman came into the barn and sat and waited and waited and muttered, and I fell asleep. But when I woke up, he wasn't there. He didn't see me, of course. Dick! Jew, I think I know what happened. The second man that came into the barn was the person the wild-eyed man wanted to give the message to. He saw you creep into the barn, Dick, and thought you were the man in there, waiting for the message in paper. Yes, but how did he know my name? He didn't. The other man's name must have been Dick, too. Don't you see? When he tapped and called Dick, Dick, you thought he was calling you. And you took the message. So he then went off. And when the second man, the real Dick, came along, it was too late. You, Dick, had got the message. Well worked out, Anne. Yes. And do you remember that boy who told us about Mrs. Taggart's place? He said her son was a terror. And known as... 
Dirty Dick. His name must be Dick too. That proves the tan is right. Well done, Anne. Would this have anything to do with the escaped prisoner? It might. He might have been the prisoner himself. That fellow who came with the message. He said the message and note were from someone called Naylor. Naylor. Hmm. Well, perhaps Naylor is in prison. A friend of the man who escaped, and knowing he was going to make a dash for it, gave him a message for the old woman's son, Dirty Dick. It may have been a pre-arranged plan. How do you mean? Well, when the bells rang out, Dirty Dick knew that the escaped prisoner was to bring him a message, and he was to wait in the barn for him. My word, I think you're right. I'm glad I didn't know that fellow at the window was an escaped convict. I think we should tell the police about all this. It might be important. Let's look at the map and see where the next village is. There would have a policeman. It was a village called Rebels, so they all got up and headed that way through the valley. Eventually, they reached the village where they went straight to the police station to tell their story. But they had a disappointing surprise. For once, they came across a most unhelpful policeman who flatly refused to believe their story, accused them of wasting his time, and told them that the prisoner had been caught anyway, and they'd interrupted his lunch hour with their silly jokes about a secret message. Then he made a snorting noise and went back to his sausages and onions. Disappointed, but realizing that their story did seem a bit strange, the famous five called at a farmhouse. And ate a delicious meal during which Julian had the idea that they should go and find two trees themselves and see what it looked like. That's if there was such a place. The others agreed that this would be a marvelous plan, and that the best place to ask about two trees would be at the village post office. The post office was part of the village store, and as they entered, the old man who kept it looked over the top of his glasses at them. Excuse me. But do you know a place called Two Trees? Two Trees, yes, that was a lovely place once, but it's all in ruins now. It was built beside a strange dark lake in the middle of the moors. Gloomy water. Yes, that's right, gloomy water. A real miserable place that is, but used to be so fine. What happened to Two Trees? It was burnt. The owner was away, and it flared up one night. No one knows why or how. Burnt to a shell, it was. The fire engine couldn't get out there, you see, because there's only a cart track to the place. Wasn't it ever built up again? No, wasn't worth it. The owner let it fall to rack and ruin. Birds and animals have taken it over now. <laughs> I went out there once. There was nothing to see but the shell of the place. And the dark blue water. <laughs> Gloomy water is a good name for that lake. Could you tell us the way, and how long it would take us to get there? What for do you want to go and gaze at an old ruin? We just thought we'd go and see Gloomy Water. It's such a strange name. Which way is it? Did you say? Well, he didn't say. But if you're so set on it, have you got a map? Uh, yes, here. All spread it out then. Now, where's my pen? Ah, ah, here it is now. You see where where I'm making them crosses on the map. Now they mark marshland. Now don't go there, or you'll be trapped up to your knees in water. You follow these paths I'm marking for you, and you'll be all right. Thanks very much. How long will it take for us to get there?、Mm, two hours or more. Don't try and go this afternoon. You will find yourself in darkness coming back, and with them marshy bits, you're in danger all the time. Right. Thanks very much. Um, we're thinking of doing a bit of camping, as the weather is so beautiful. I suppose you couldn't hire us some ground sheets and rugs. Oh, I've got some somewhere. Better you camping out in October than me. <laughs> well, ju just a minute. They're, they're out the back. Thank you. What's going on? What's the idea? Camping, Jude. I'll explain outside. Here they are. Thank you. Just what we want. 
And here's the money for them. Oh, thank you. A good day to you. <laughs> Better you than me. Julian, what's up? What's all this camping stuff for? Well, I suddenly thought we ought to go to Gloomy Water and snoop around. And if we took things and camped out in the ruin, we might make more of our few days. What a good idea! Well, I feel quite sure that there's something up at Two Trees. We might even meet Maggie there. We might. But I think somebody ought to follow up that message besides Maggie. Dear Maggie, I wonder who in the world she is. Somebody worth watching if she's the friend of convicts. Look, I thought we could buy some extra food, go to Gloomy Water this afternoon, find a good place to shelter in in the old ruin, and get some heather or bracken for beds. Then tomorrow, bright and early, we can have a look around. Sounds smashing, the sort of thing we like. What do you say, Tim? They bought some bread, butter, potted meat, a big fruit cake, chocolate biscuits and a large bottle of lemonade and set off. It was a really lovely walk over the moorlands with some beautiful views. As they approached two trees, Julian was very careful to take the right paths traced carefully on his map by the man in the post office. He didn't want them to be caught in the marshes. The sun began to sink low and the children hurried as fast as they could. They finally went down an overgrown cart track which wound through a wood and suddenly came on what had once been the lovely house of two trees. It was a desolate ruin, blackened and scorched with fire. The windows had no glass. The roof had gone except for a few rafters here and there. Two birds flew up with a loud cry as the children went into the silent house. The upper floors were burned out and the ground floor was pretty bad too, with a mouldy smell about it. While the other three were out gathering bracken and heather to make beds, Anne looked round and found the top of a flight of steps which obviously led down to a cellar. When the others came back, she told them about it and Julian lit his torch and led the way down although Timmy managed to get just in front. They found themselves in a strange little room with moth-eaten carpets and furnishings thick with dust and cobwebs. There were a few old candles in candlesticks which they lit and they decided it would be far better to sleep down there than up in the burnt-out rooms. So they piled the heather on the floor and dusted off an old table which caused them all to have fits of coughing. There was a cupboard there with old cups and jugs in it, which they placed on the table. Anne had noticed a pump by the sink, so Julian went up and tried it, and to his delight, cold, clean water came from it. By the time they had lighted more candles, washed the cups and spread the food out, the cellar looked quite cheerful and pleasant, and over bread and butter and potted meat, the four decided to sleep there that night, and then have all the next day to examine two trees and the lake. Do you suppose there's some secret here, Julian? Yes, and I think I know what it is. What? what? Well, we know that a prisoner named Naylor sent a message by his escaped friend to two people. One to Dirty Dick, who didn't get it, and the other to Maggie, whoever she is. Now, suppose Naylor had done some big robberies, jewels or something, and hides the stuff till he hopes the human cry dies over but gets caught and put in prison for a number of years. Well, he won't tell the police where the stuff is, will he? And he don't write a letter to tell his friends where it is, so what does he do? Waits till someone escapes and gives him a message. And that's what happened. 
The round-headed man I saw was the escaped prisoner, and he was sent to tell Dirty Dick and Maggie where the stuff was, so they could get it before anyone else did. Right. The prisoner didn't understand the message, but Dirty Dick and Maggie would, because they knew all about the robbery. And now Maggie will try and find the stuff. And we must find it first. What was the last clue in the message, Dick? Saucy Jane. It sounds like a boat. Of course. I bet we shall find a boat by the lake called Saucy Jane, and the stolen goods will be in it. Too easy. I reckon the Saucy Jane is a clue. And don't forget that the piece of paper must have something to do with it. Yes. Have you still got it, Dick? Of course. Here it is. Hmm. Four lines drawn, meeting in the centre. At the outer end of each line is a word. They're a bit faint. Shine your torch a minute, Dick. Yes, I can read them now. This one is Tock Hill. The next is Steeple. Then there's Chimney and Tall Stone. Well, I can't imagine what all that means, but it's clearly important. We mustn't forget that dear Maggie has a copy of the paper too. She probably knows what it means. If she does, she'll come here to Two Trees. Shall we hide if we see her? No, she won't know we've got the message and paper. So we'll just say we're on a hike and sheltering here for the night. And we can keep an eye on her and see what she does. I wouldn't think she'd come alone. More likely to come with Dirty Dick. She would expect him to have had the message too, and would get in touch with him. And be surprised he hadn't got the message. It's all very complicated, but I'm half asleep. I think I'm going to settle down. The only thing is, you don't think Maggie and her friend are about and might pounce on us, do you? That's silly, Anne. Do you honestly suppose that Timmy would lie there so quietly if there was anyone else about? He'd be barking his head off. By this time, all four were very tired, and settled down on their heather beds, confident that they would be safe with Timmy on guard. The four slept like logs. Nobody moved except Timmy, who twice went up to investigate some sounds. However, the first was just a toad, and the second a fox. The children slept soundly till half past eight. After a wash under the pump and a quick breakfast, they tidied up the room and set off to see if there was a boathouse by the lake where the saucy Jane might be hidden. They walked beside the lake as best they could, but it was difficult because bushes and trees grew right down to the edge. Just as they were giving up hope, they came to a little backwater, and there, built right across it and covered with ivy and brambles, was a boathouse. The wooden boards on the side were so rotten that they could easily pull them away to make an opening, which they all climbed through. Once inside, after their eyes became accustomed to the darkness, they could make out three boats. Two of them were half full of water, with their bows sunk right down. Julian shone his torch around, and they could see old oars strung in one corner. It was a dreary, desolate sight. I don't like this place much. It's so damp and deserted. Flash your torch on that boat, Dick. What's it called? Meg, the Merry Meg. Well, she might be the sister of Saucy Jane. What's the next one called? Cheeky Charlie. Charlie, brother to Merry Meg. All I can say is that poor old boat looks anything but cheeky. The last one must be Saucy Jane. I do hope so. It isn't. It's careful, Carrie. Well, it's quite obvious the saucy Jane belongs to this family of boats here. But where is she? Sunk out of sight? No, look. It's so shallow we'll be able to spot anything on the bottom. It's quite clear by the light of our torches. Hello. What's that flat wooden thing standing up right over there? It's a raft. Looks in good condition too. It might be fun to see if it will carry us on water. Oh yes. Later, perhaps. But where is the saucy Jane? Do you think she might be hidden somewhere on the banks of the lake? That's an idea. We ought to explore round and see if we can find her. I'm sure the loot is on her somewhere. All right, let's go now. The children left the boathouse and went to the edge of the silent lake 
and decided to try the left bank first. But they found nothing, and after a quarter of a mile the undergrowth became so thick it was quite impossible to force their way through it. So it was decided to give up, much to Timmy's disappointment, who was the only one enjoying himself. They were just on their way back to the old house, wondering if they should perhaps explore the lake by raft, when Timmy suddenly stopped. What's up, Timmy? What is it? Look, through the trees, by the house, two people. Maggie! I bet it's Maggie! And Dirty Dick! I recognise him! Yes, that's Dirty Dick, all right. So that's Maggie! Well, I don't like her. She looks as hard as nails. A good companion for Nayla. Look, we'll just walk out quite naturally and let them see us. Act as if we're a bunch of harmless kids. If there are any leading questions, leave them to me. Ready? Anne and George didn't like the look of the woman, who was wearing trousers and had a jacket draped over her shoulders. She was smoking a cigarette and wore sunglasses. And Dick didn't like the look of the man any more than he did at the old cottage. The man and the woman looked surprised and annoyed when they saw the four children swing out of the bushes, chattering away with Timmy bounding along beside them. It all looks pretty wild, doesn't it? Yes. The old house looks worse than ever this morning. Hey, you children. What are you doing here? Just hiking. It's our half term. Don't you know this is private property? No, it's only a burnt-out ruin. Anyone can come. We want to explore the lake. It looks exciting. You can't. It's too dangerous. People are forbidden to bathe in it or to use a boat. We weren't told that. We were told how to get here, and no one said the lake was forbidden. We want to watch the moorhens, and we've been told there's deer near here. And wild ponies. We saw some yesterday. Stop this nonsense! People aren't allowed here! Now clear out before we make you! Why are you here, then? You, you, you clear off, I say, or I shall come and... <laughs> well, take hold of that dog's collar. He looks savage. He is savage, and I'm not holding his collar while you're about. Don't think it. It's all right, children. My friend just lost his temper for a moment. Call your dog back. Not while you're about. How long are you staying? What's that got to do with you? <laughs> Let's go and have something to eat. The famous five marched forward. Timmy barked savagely as they came close to the unpleasant couple, who shrank back at once and eyed the children angrily as they went past. George placed Timmy on guard at the doorway of the old house, and the four children went down to their cellar, where they looked round to see if anyone had been there while they were away. But nothing seemed to have been moved. They had a quick lunch and went to the boathouse to see if they could launch the raft on the water but their hearts sank as they saw Maggie and Dirty Dick out on the lake in the only good boat from the boathouse, the Merry Meg. Dirty Dick was rowing hard. Did they know where the Saucy Jane was? As quickly as they could, the children manhandled the big raft onto the water, where it bobbed about gently. Julian jumped onto it and held it steady, while the others got on, and Timmy, last but not least, joined them with a bump that made the raft bob about violently. Then the four children, each with a small paddle, took the raft down the little backwater and out onto the lake itself. And it wasn't long before they got near to the Merry Meg, where Maggie and Dirty Dick were sitting close together, examining something. You stopped rowing. Do you suppose they have a piece of paper like the one we have and are examining it? I don't know, but let's get as near to them as we can. It'll make them mad at us, but I can't help that. Oh, they've heard us and seen us. They look really angry. Pretend we're out rowing just for fun. All right. Hello, we took the raft out. It goes well. Does your boat go all right? You'll get into trouble taking that raft without permission. Tell us where you got permission to use the boat, and we'll ask them if we can use the raft. Go away. We don't want you kids spoiling our afternoon. We like to be friendly, don't we? Yes, we yes, like to be friendly. They're not very pleased with us. Look, they're rowing off. 
Come on, follow them. We might learn something. But they didn't learn anything. Dirty Dick rode to the west bank, then out into the middle again, then over to the left bank, and all the time the children followed until they realised he was taunting them. So tired and hot and a bit quarrelsome, they gave up the chase and went back to the boathouse, where they tied the raft up under some bushes and made their way back to the house. They felt much better after a good supper, and with Timmy planted at the top of the stairs as guard, they discussed their plans for the next day. We must find the loop before we return to school on Tuesday. We really must. Let's see the plan again, Jew. I saw a tall stone for a second or so when we were on the lake. So did I, on a high slope about a mile away. We were so busy paddling, I didn't have time to say anything. And remember, there is a tall stone marked on the plan. Yes, here it is, at the end of one of the lines. And at the other end of the line, it says Tock Hill. Get your local map out, Jew, and see if there is a place called Tock Hill. All right. Now, let's see. Hmm, Tock Hill. Tock Hill. There it is! On the opposite side to where George and I saw Tall Stone. Tall Stone on one side, and Tock Hill on the other. That surely means something. It does! It's bearings given to show the whereabouts of the hidden goods, and... Listen! Listen! I know how to read the plan. It's easy. Let's take all the clues we know. First, the spoken clues. Two trees, that's here. Gloomy water is where the stuff is hidden. Saucy Jane is a boat that contains the stuff. Go on. Maggie knows. Well, she's here, and probably an old friend of Naylor's. Now for the clues on the paper plan. Tall stone, tock hill, chimney and steeple. It must be the only spot on gloomy water where all four things can be seen at the same time. And that's where the stuff is. Well done, Dick. The saucy Jane must be there, either on or in the water. We've got to find that spot. The next morning, they launched the raft and paddled around the lake until Anne and George saw the tall stone again. Then, keeping that in sight, they gently paddled about until they saw Tock Hill and a gleaming distant steeple. Then, to their delight, the chimney on the old house came into view, and bristling with excitement, they kept the raft still at this spot where they could see all four clues. Then Julian took a long piece of string from his pocket, tied his heavy torch to the end of it, and dropped it into the water, letting the string run through his fingers as the weight went down. After a short while, it stopped, and Julian knew that his torch had reached the bed of the lake. Then, from his pocket, he brought out a large piece of cork, tied the end of the piece of string around it, and dropped it into the water. It bobbed there, held by the string, which led right down to the torch on the lake bed below. There, it's done. I thought that piece of cork I found in the cellar might be useful. I've marked the place now. That was jolly clever, Jew. We must be right over the loot. Yes, and the water's quite clear, isn't it? Perhaps we could Look! See... There! The other string resting on the bottom of the lake. The saucy Jane! It must be! So it is. Naylor must have put the loot in the saucy Jane, rowed it out to this spot, taken the bearings, hold the boat so it sank, and then swum back to the shore. That's very clever, but... <laughs> What's the matter with Timmy? Oh dear, look! It's the Merry Meg, with Maggie and Dirty Dick in it. They haven't seen us yet. No, they're too busy reading their piece of paper. Anyhow, they won't guess we've read the bearings and marked it. No, but they won't half be wild when they see we're right over the place they're looking for. It looks as if Maggie has spotted Torstone and Tock Hill. Oh, they've seen us! They're coming this way, fast! What are you not doing here? Get out of our way! There's plenty of room on this lake. What do you want this bit for? We aren't doing any harm. Hey, mind where you're going. We'll report you to the police, taking a raft that doesn't belong to you and sleeping in a house where you've got no right to be. Get out of our way! Hey! Look out, she nearly had us over. 
What do you think you're doing? Get away from us or we'll send our dog after you. He's longing to come over now. Now look, you kids, be sensible. My friend and I only want a quiet weekend, and it isn't nice to find you four everywhere we go. Are you on half-term holiday or something? Yes. When do you go back? Tomorrow. You'll be rid of us then. But we're going to enjoy ourselves on this raft till then. There was a hurried conference on the Merry Meg. Then Dirty Dick rode off to the edge of the lake. It was obvious they were going to wait until the next day after the children had gone and then collect the loot. Once they were out of sight, Julian decided that he would dive down and see what there was on the sunken saucy Jane. Despite protests from the others that it was too cold, he stripped off his jersey and dived neatly into the water with hardly a splash. The three others craned over the edge of the raft, where they could just make him out down in the depth of the lake like a ghostly figure. At last, and to the relief of the others, he came up panting hard, trying to make up for holding his breath for so long. When his breathing grew more even, he grinned at them. That's better. Well, it's there. Is it? Did you see it? Did you touch it? Yes, I dived right to the bottom. And there's the poor old saucy Jane rotting to bits. And in one end of her is a waterproof bag. The loot must be in it. Did it feel heavy? Too heavy to get up by diving for it. I'll have to dive down and fix a rope to it. And then we'll all give a heave ho. And up she'll come. Oh, I'm cold now. Dry yourself in my blazer, tree And put your jersey back on. Hey, what's that glinting on the bank? Is someone watching us through field glasses? It'll be Maggie and Dirty Dick. Blow. That'll put an end to us hauling up the loot. They'd see it and wait for us. They won't guess we've already found it. But I bet they were worried when they saw me dive in just over the sunken boat. Anyhow, we'll have to go back to the boathouse and get some rope. But even when we got some rope, how would you propose we get the bag up from the boat? They'll be watching us through those glasses every time we come out. There's only one time to come when they won't be able to watch us. And that's tonight. We'll come tonight. That's a smashing idea. Let's go back now, before you get cold, Jew. They won't come back here. They'll wait till we've gone tomorrow. They paddled rapidly away, and Dick took a last glance to make sure that the piece of cork was still bobbing about on the water to mark the spot where the sunken boat lay. Yes, it was still there. Just before midnight that night, the moon was well up and very bright. So keeping in the shadows, the five crept down to the lakeside. The water gleamed in the moonlight, and a bright moon path ran all down it. It was lovely to see, but the lake looked very dark and brooding as they pushed out the raft, threw on the coil of rope which they fetched from the boathouse, clambered aboard, and set off. At least it's a heavenly night. I'm quite peaceful. Don't start the owls hooting by talking too loud. It's a weird sort of lake. Is anyone looking for our four bearings? Well, we are going in the right direction. Come on, paddle on gently, everyone. Look, there's the tall stone. And that's Tok Hill over there. And there's the steeple shining in the moonlight. I bet Naylor hid his loot out here on a moonlit night. All the bearings can be seen so clearly. And there's the chimney now. We've got them all in view. We must be near. And there's a piece of cork. Look, how extremely clever we are. I really have a great admiration for the five. Idiot. Go on, strip now, Dick. We'll do our job straight away. Oh, it's cold. Look after our clothes, Anne. Got the rope, Dick? Come on, then. In we go. The two boys had to surface for breath several times before they finished the task of tying the rope round the waterproof bag. And when they had, it proved impossible to haul it up without tipping the raft and spilling the five into the cold waters of the lake. So they decided to paddle back to the shore, letting the bag drag behind them. When they reached the edge of the lake, Julian and Dick pulled the bag out of the water, and between them 
carried it cautiously back to the house. Once there, they left Timmy on guard and bumped the heavy, dripping bundle down the cellar steps. Then, in twinkling candlelight, Julian cut the strong stitches and began to unwrap the bag. Back up, Jim. I shall tear it open myself in a minute. I'm going as fast as I can. There! <gasps> jewelry boxes! It is jewelry, then. Look at the necklace in this box. It's magnificent. It must be that wonderful necklace stolen from the Queen of Falonia. I saw a picture of it in the papers. What diamonds! No wonder Nayla hid these stolen goods so carefully in such an ingenious place. And no wonder Maggie and Dirty Dick were longing to find them. Let's see what else there is. There were scores of little boxes, each one containing precious stones of some kind. Sapphire bracelets, ruby and diamond rings, a wonderful opal necklace and earrings, heavy with enormous diamonds. When they had finished admiring them, Julian sat on the edge of the table. Now, let's see. We'd better start fairly early tomorrow and get these things to the police. Not that awful policeman we saw the other day. No. We'll phone up that nice Mr. Gaston and ask him which police station he recommends us to go to. Have we got to carry all these boxes? No, that would be asking for trouble. We'll wrap up the jewels in our hankies and stuff them down the bottom of our rucksacks. We'll leave the boxes here. The police can collect them afterwards if they want to. So, it was all decided. The next morning, they set off each with a rucksack on their back, and each with jewels worth thousands of pounds in their charge. But when they were a little distance from Two Trees, they had a surprise. Come here, you lot! It's Maggie and Dirty Dick. What's up with them? They're trying to cut us off. Look! They've left the path and are taking a shortcut to come across to us. There's marshland all around. What idiots they are. They'll get bogged. They look as if they've gone mad. What's the matter with them? I know. They've been into the cellar and found the bag and all the empty jewellery boxes. They know we've got the goods. Of course. We should have thrown the boxes into the cellar beyond and locked the door. You come here, you lot! Dirty Dick looks as if he's gone out of his mind with rage. Let's hurry on. That man looks savage. But stick to the path and no shortcuts. Look, Maggie's in difficulties already. Help! I'm sinking! Somebody help me! He's ah! ankle deep in the marsh. Oh, I'll kill you, kid, when I get you! He's getting nearer. Ah! He's sunk up to his knees in the marsh. It's horrible. Help! Help! I'm sinking! Get my ankle! I'm broken! it! Maggie! Come over here and help me, Maggie! I can't! to help them? No, they can't get far now, and it'll be easy for the police when they come to collect them. Yes, nicely embedded in the marsh. I don't feel sorry for either of them. They're bad lots. Help, 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 me. Me. Help, 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 help me! Two hours later, they arrived back at Rebels, and Julian telephoned Mr Gaston, who listened with amazement to his story and could hardly believe his ears. However, within half an hour, he arrived in his car and drove them all to the police station at Gathercombe, where he knew the inspector. Come into my room. Now, Mr Gaston has warned me that you were coming. Now, first of all, where are these jewels? Let's have a look at them before you start your story. Here's mine. There they are. Inside my hanky. Phew. The very jewels, and to think the police everywhere have been hunting them for months and months. Where did you find them? Well, it's a rather long story. It was our half-term holiday, and we all decided to go on a hiking weekend and take Timmy with us. Mr Gaston and the inspector listened with amazement as Julian told their story. He did it very well, prompted by the others when he forgot anything. When he'd finished, the inspector reached for the telephone. Will those two still be there, stuck in the marshes? Oh, yes. 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 They're really bogged down. <laughs> right. Sergeant, take three men and the car and go to the marshes near gloomy water and pick up a man and woman floundering there. 
Yes, our old friend Dirty Dick and Maggie Martin. Right you are. <laughs> well, children, I'm very proud to meet you. You're the kind of youngsters we need. Plucky, sensible, use your brains and never give up. And now, what's your programme? Well, we're supposed to be back at school at three o'clock, but I don't think we can arrive in this mess. We'd get into an awful row. Oh, I think we can arrange that. And perhaps a good meal, too. Oh, I'm starving. And then I'll run you back to school in the police car. We can't do too much for people who produce the felonia diamonds out of rucksacks, you know. <laughs> Bless us all. I, I still can't believe it. After they had bathed and eaten and said goodbye to Mr. Gaston, they climbed into a large police car waiting for them at the door. It was exactly half past two. Just half an hour to get back in time. The inspector grinned as he drove off. It's all right. You'll be back at your school in good time. And if anyone believes your tale, I'll be surprised. Off we go. Wow, 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 wow.